Tonight was the season finale of Friday Night SmackDown, and the reason I know that is because next week is the season premiere, so you cannot have a season premiere without first having a season finale. And that is what we had tonight. We had an unholy alliance being forged between the two top heel factions in the company, the Bloodline, or what's left of it, and the Judgment Day. Because we had everybody on we had everybody on the show tonight. It didn't matter what brand you're from, Raw, SmackDown, NXT. It's pretty much just a free-for-all at this point. So we had a lot of members from different brands on the show tonight to hype up Fast Lane, which is tomorrow night. And tonight in the main event, we had LA Knight and Jimmy Uso, but it really wasn't a match. It was more of an angle to set up what came after the match. And we had John Cena. We had LA Knight outnumbered, outmanned, outgunned by the Judgment Day and the Bloodline. And just when things looked most bleak for the babyfaces, we had Jey Uso and we had Cody Rhodes from Monday Night Raw making an appearance to even the odds. We had a big brawl to close out the show, big crowd-pleasing brawl, lots of chaos. And the babyfaces were standing tall when they went off the air tonight. We now know it is official, even though we've known this for a few weeks, but they made it official tonight that next week, next Friday night on SmackDown on the season premiere, guess who's coming back to work? The Tribal Chief is coming back to SmackDown next week. Roman Reigns will finally be back on TV. First time since SummerSlam, he will be back on the program. But that is not the only thing they are promoting for next week's show. They're also promoting a special appearance by Triple H. They did not tell us what Triple H is going to be there for. They did not even tease what the announcement might be. But they said that he would be making, not even a special announcement, he would be there making a special appearance. But if he's going to be making an appearance, he's not going to come out and wave and say hi and then walk to the back. Obviously, he's going to be there because he has something to announce. And so we might just finally find out next week. Who SmackDown got as trade compensation for Jey Uso going to Monday Night Raw? Could that be the announcement? Or could it be tied in with the announcement of a War Games match? Because this is going to be the first SmackDown post-pay-per-view and the first SmackDown on the road to Survivor Series. That is going to be the next show next month in Chicago. And so could we get the announcement that there will, in fact, for the second year in a row, uh, be a War Games match at Survivor Series? Maybe so. Certainly, I have my own thoughts on what a War Games match might be looking like after the ending of the show tonight. But we also have some news. 
because they are in Indianapolis. We have a pay-per-view coming up tomorrow night. I'm going to be back with you live in 24 hours talking about that show. But in addition to that, PW Insider had an update that Jade Cargill has been spotted in Indianapolis. Now, there were rumors that she would be in town for the show. Not necessarily that she would be on the pay-per-view tomorrow night, but that she was going to be backstage. She may have been backstage tonight as well. But we know she's in town. And so there is at least a decent chance that we could get the debut of Jade Cargill on television tomorrow night uh, at Fastlane if they wanted her to make an appearance. So that is a possibility because she will be there. And of course, we are also building to Super Tuesday coming up next week because for the first time in a few years, we're going to get head to head on television. Thank you. Base Beerus, God of Seduction. Thank you. Thank you very much for that $12 super chat. For the first time in a few years this Tuesday, head-to-head, -head, NXT, and AEW Dynamite. Because Dynamite is being bumped a day earlier because of the MLB playoffs on Wednesday, uh, which get priority over wrestling. So Dynamite's going a day early next week. And NXT is loading up the show. They had a commercial for the show tonight. John Cena is going to be making his NXT debut. Cody Rhodes is going to have a special announcement on the show. Asuka is going to be wrestling a match on the show. Becky Lynch is the NXT Women's Champion. I'm sure she'll be on the show. Dominic Mysterio is the North American Champion. Rhea Ripley has been hanging around NXT with him. So there's going to be a huge influx of main roster personalities. Paul Heyman is going to be in the corner of Braun Breaker for his match with Carmelo Hayes. But at the end of the commercial that they aired for SmackDown, we heard Look, a everyone, gong. It's Samoa Bro. No, it was not for Samoa Bro. We heard a gong signaling The Undertaker. So, if you didn't think the WWE was going all in, or wasn't going all in on this NXT show coming up on Tuesday, you didn't think John Cena was enough in Cody Rhodes. Now you're getting The Undertaker on NXT. I mean, the way things are going, we may end up with John Cena against The Undertaker on NXT Tuesday night. Take that, Tony Khan. Try to counter-program that. They are throwing everything they can at it. And I, I fully expect NXT is going gonna, is gonna to mop the floor with Dynamite next week. I mean, you have a show in Dynamite that's not airing in its normal time slot. That alone puts them at a disadvantage. But the way WWE is going all out to promote this show, not a doubt in my mind, NXT is going to mop the floor with them next week. And I don't really personally care who wins next week. We all win. I'm looking forward to it. I still don't even know how I'm going to cover it, if I'm going to try to cover both shows or not. But it's going to be a fun night next Tuesday. It's going to be a fun night tonight, too, because in case you couldn't tell, I don't just walk around every day wearing this shit on my head just for the fun of it. Uh, yes, it is my birthday. I want to take a moment here to thank everybody for all the nice birthday wishes. I heard from a lot of people. Uh, all throughout the day today, so uh, I want to say thank you. Uh, sometimes it falls on the actual day where we get to stream live. Tonight is one of those nights, so I get to close out my birthday with all of you on this, the Friday Night Smackdown Review for October 6, 2023. I am the Solomon Monster. You know what would make me happy on my birthday? You hit that like button. I think that would be pretty cool. Hit that like button on the video. Subscribe. Super Chats are open. You are already seeing them pop up. I will be going through them as I always do. And channel memberships are open as well. I got to say thank you to Lady Fire Panda, who gifted 20 channel memberships before I even went live tonight. That's right, 20 to zero. And uh, Zizu gifted a membership as well. So thank you to the both of you. Very kind of you. Two people that you will find often here uh, joining us in the live chat on these streams. Should I keep the hat on? Take the hat off. No, keep it on. I'll let you guys vote. All right, LA Knight. LA Knight opened the show tonight, came out, got a huge ovation, as he does every single week. But before he could get going here, he was interrupted by Paul Heyman, who made his way out to the ring along with Jimmy Uso and Solo Sokoa flanking him. He said that he has a knack for being able to recognize the next big thing. He's been doing it for a very long time. And now he says the next big thing in his view is L.A. Knight. Giving L.A. Knight his props here in this segment. And now that L.A. Knight has earned his attention, the bloodline will have to do something about it. 
the overwhelming consensus seems to be that I should keep this on. I shall keep it on. So Knight asked Heyman if he was done running his fat jowls. And he thanked Heyman for the kind words. And then he pulled out a receipt. We got props here from LA Knight. Actual prop. I'm not saying giving props. An actual prop. He pulled a receipt out from his back pocket. And he checked his receipt. And he said he didn't buy any of this BS. And you may think that's corny. I give, him, I give him points for creativity for at least using props. thought that was a clever way to make With use of that. In my eye. A 16 Entertainment, thank you for the 1992 Ric Flair Rumble Chat. Jimmy told Knight to shut his mouth, and the cameras didn't really pick up on it, but he had snatched the microphone uh, out of Paul Heyman's hand. Heyman was holding his hand out like, Jimmy had snatched it away. This is not the first time we've seen him do that. He's done that a couple of times recently where Heyman's in the middle of speaking and Jimmy will just take the microphone away from him, uh, almost as if he's the tribal chief. So he took the mic, he told Knight to shut his mouth, and Jimmy told him that he's not going to make it to Fastlane. And he and Solo, they started to make their way into the ring when John Cena's music hit. And he ran down to the ring got inside to stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder with L.A. Now, I hate the Juliet. Thank you for the 1992. So he was reciprocating L.A. Knight's favor when he came out last week. So they were squaring up for a fight. Heyman convinced Solo and Jimmy to back off. Knight said that they didn't have permission from their little chief to come out here. He said that he's not thinking about fast lane. He's thinking about tonight. He's thinking that it should be him and Jimmy Uso one on one. Jimmy said, "Yeah." Not not that he was trying to mimic. You know, when LA Knight says yeah, he was saying yeah, as in I accept the challenge. And this caught Heyman off guard. Heyman said, "What are you doing?" He goes, "Look, we've just got to clear this first. We've got to clear this with the tribal chief. You don't have permission." So you know that was a nice little endorsement. Uh, that Heyman gave to L.A. Knight instead of just, you know, tearing him down, you know, because he's a heel and L.A. Knight's a babyface. He put him over. He put him over and said, yeah, you are the next big thing. And now you are a target. You are a target of the bloodlines. But he put the guy over and that was a nice endorsement. He wasn't acting sarcastic or anything like that when he said that. So they are really all in with L.A. Knight. I think it's pretty apparent by now. I mean, you'd have to be blind not to see it. Uh, but it reminds me of what Triple H said in the Money in the Bank scrum. You know, after the pay-per-view back on the very first day in July, he was asked about L.A. Knight, who was fingertips away from pulling down the briefcase, and he fell just short. And he was asked about L.A. Knight at the media scrum, and Triple H said, good things come to those who wait. And myself and a lot of other people had very good reason to be skeptical of that, because we've seen this time and time again in WWE. Someone gets hot, or it looks like they're starting to get hot. The company doesn't really get fully behind them. Uh, or in the case of L.A. Knight, I mean, look at what they had him doing last year. Look at what they had him doing earlier this year. It was, you know, one of those situations where I'll believe it when I see it. And he went in there at SummerSlam, and he won the Slim Jim Battle Royal. And really, ever since then, you could tell they put their full muscle behind him. He's a huge merch mover in the company. He got the Slim Jim endorsement. Him and I think Bianca Belair basically are the two faces, and that's a major money sponsorship for this company. And he's the face of it. He's like the modern-day macho man now, right? He's Mr. Slim Jim. That's a big deal. So you can see these different instances where the company really is getting behind him, and this is just another example of that. He's teaming with John Cena in a pay-per-view main event, what I assume is the main event, tomorrow night. So the sky's the limit for this guy. If his popularity doesn't wane, and it's showing no signs of that whatsoever, I mean, these people love this guy, uh, he's going places. And he really is finally, for the first time in his career, he is getting the big push. The company sees something in him. Whereas a year ago, a certain someone didn't see something in him. So it's good to see. And by the way, in this segment, he was clearly positioned as... The number one star. John Cena came out there, right? Everybody cheered, but he was almost just like a background player. This was a segment where L.A. Knight was clearly the main star of the segment. Now, the Judgment Day was shown in the back. 
and they were arriving with all of their titles. Dominic won the North American Championship back on NXT Tuesday night from Trick Williams. As they were walking, J.D. McDonough, he was waiting for them, and Priest wanted to know, what's he doing here? And Rhea said, calm down. I invited him here. Remember, for a reason. And they all walked into the building together. We had Charlotte Flair and Asuka. Can they coexist? I don't know. Can they? We'll find out, because it was Charlotte and Asuka taking on Bailey and Io Sky of Damage Control. Fast lane tomorrow night, we are getting a triple threat match. It will be Charlotte, it will be Io, it will be Asuka for the WWE Women's Championship. Asuka got the hot tag about midway through from Charlotte. Just at the moment that Bailey tagged in, and the fans were into this, Charlotte went to the top, she hit a high cross body. Io entered the ring, and Charlotte hit a fallaway slam. Charlotte followed that up with a neckbreaker on Bailey, and she went for her cartwheel clothesline. By the way, I'm going to take this off because it is cutting cutting off my <laughs> circulation here. So we're gonna put we're gonna put that over there. Maybe we'll bring it back after. Choking myself out here. Charlotte goes for her cartwheel clothesline. We've seen her do this in matches before. She's very athletic. She's a, she's a gymnast. So she can do cartwheels and all sorts of things. The problem is she does this cartwheel into the clothesline move. When she's doing the cartwheel, she slows to a crawl. And so she slowed to a crawl here as well, which gave Bailey the chance to cut her off. But it just looks terrible. It's like, you know, she, she just go for a clothesline. But she has to put her little spin on it, and it just looks like she's moving in slow motion. So Bailey cut her off. Charlotte tried it again. This time, though, she hit the clothesline. Asuka tagged in and put Bailey on the top rope. Oh, this, this was priceless. So she puts her on the top rope. And Charlotte tags in Asuka. They're both setting up for a superplex. Well, here comes Io. And Io gets underneath all of them. And we've seen the Tower of Doom, right, hundreds of times. So Io goes, and she hits a Tower of Doom, and she power bombs the baby faces who in turn suplex Bailey, superplex Bailey, from the top rope all the way down to the mat in the process. Now, <laughs> I know the Tower of Doom looks cool. It's a cool-looking spot. But in a situation like this, it is incredibly stupid because it doesn't make any sense. When you are in a position where your own partner is on top and is the one in jeopardy of being suplexed all the way from the top rope to the mat, it doesn't help your partner to scoot underneath and slam everybody at the same time. I don't see how that really helps Bailey in this situation, and it didn't. She killed her own partner in the process. It is incredibly stupid. In a fatal four-way match, in some sort of multi-man, multi-woman match, every man, woman, child, whatever for themselves, I get it, right? If you can pull it off, it looks great and it makes sense because everyone is fighting for themselves. In a situation like this, it just, it's just stupid. It's just so stupid. So anyway, everybody is down now, including Bailey, thanks to her partner. Io hit a meteora on Charlotte. Asuka was on the apron, was holding Bailey. And Bailey moved out of the way just as Charlotte came in. And of course, wouldn't you know, Charlotte booted Asuka off the apron. A miscommunication. I'm stunned. I can't believe it. This is my shocked face right here. Down to the floor goes Asuka. Bailey knees Charlotte in the face. She wants to go for the figure eight. Charlotte, though, kicks her into Io, who was on the apron, knocks her off, and then Charlotte hits a very sloppy. Natural selection for the win. Uh, the match itself was good. It's unfortunate that the finish sucked because the natural selection just looked awful. But I thought the rest of the match was fine. I thought it was good. Uh, the accidental kick to Asuka was predictable, you know, given that all three of them are wrestling each other tomorrow night. Uh, and Bailey knocking Io off the apron inadvertently, that keeps the um, tensions high within the ranks of uh, damage control. So. 
yeah, all of that made sense. Charlotte winning here, I'm hopeful, bodes well for EO's chances of retaining tomorrow night. EO Sky should not be losing the championship yet. And she should not be losing the championship to Charlotte Flair. She's already beaten Asuka. I don't even see what Asuka gains, frankly, from, from getting the belt back. This is EO's turn. Charlotte's had her, tur her turn. Asuka's had her turn. EO deserves to have hers. And you already have the story playing out where Bailey is clearly trying to cost EO the championship. It was her idea in the first place to put this triple threat match together. So there's a story between the two of them. You don't take the title off EO Sky until that story is resolved. Maybe Bailey is the one who beats her for the belt. But you at least have to get to that point where you can do that championship match. They haven't even gotten there yet. The backstage, Paul Heyman, Solo Sokoa, and Jimmy Uso, they're walking into what they thought was their locker room. But when they get there, they find the Judgment Day. All the members of the Judgment Day are lounging out. And we go to a commercial. That's how they leave us hanging there. A nice little cliffhanger there, heading into the commercial break, right? What's going to happen on the flip side of the break? When they come back, everybody is staring each other down intensely. Damian Priest and Solo Sokoa, they're nose to nose. Eyeball to eyeball. No blinking. Very tense situation. Rhea Ripley tells everybody to get out. She says, me and Mr. Heyman have something to discuss. And she tells Priest, it's okay. It's okay to leave. And he leaves. And then Heyman goes to Solo and says, it's okay. And Solo leaves. So now it's just Rhea and it's Paul. And she tells Heyman, let's talk. Before they cut away to the announcers at ringside. And we get highlights from last week's show with Bobby Lashley telling the Street Profits, prove it to me. Prove to me that you have the attitude necessary to be successful. And then later on in the show, Street Profits come back out. They attack Rey Mysterio and Santos Escobar. By the way, I love how they, <laughs> you know, we have these backstage segments and the camera is there and it's showing us everything that's going on. And I, I love how they cut away from these things like with, with Heyman and Rhea, before it gets good. It's almost like this is a television show. But it's just it's it just makes me laugh. So this, anyway, this led into a singles match. Rey Mysterio, non-title, he is the United States champion. Rey Mysterio, one-on-one -on -one with Bobby Lashley. This was Bobby Lashley's first match on television since May, when he was wrestling for the right to challenge for that new World Heavyweight Championship. He had to have some kind of injury. There had to be some kind of an injury involved here. Hasn't been in a match on TV since May. Hasn't wrestled a match at all since June. So it's been a while. This was David and Goliath. The size differential between the two was, was comical. After a break, Lashley was working a bear hug. Mysterio fought out of it. Lashley, though, cut him off, went right back to the bear hug. Mysterio headbutted his way out of it. Lashley responded with a whip to the corner, and he tried for another bear hug. Again, Ray fought out of it. He went to the top. He hit a seated senton, ran at Lashley. Lashley caught him. Mysterio turned it into a tornado DDT. Mysterio set up for a 619, but Lashley stopped him on the apron and just axe handled him, and Ray took this great bump down to the floor. Lashley ran Mysterio into the barricade outside and then rolled him back into the ring. And then he started throwing Santos Escobar around. Mysterio tried to hit a splash. Lashley caught him, and Mysterio slipped out, sent Lashley into the ring post. Back inside, Mysterio set up for the 619 again. This time he hit the first part of it, so he did the swing, and he connected to the ribs. He got distracted, though, by Montez Ford, so after he takes Lashley down with the proper 619, he tries to go up to the top. Montez Ford gets up on the apron to briefly distract Mysterio. And the LWO comes over, and the Street Profits and the LWO, they start brawling outside the ring. Ray sees what's going on here. And from the apron, he hits a flying seated senton, takes both members of the Street Profits down. So he wipes them out. But when Ray climbs back inside, Lashley killed him with a spear so this this looked great lashley still has one of the better spears in rest not the best but one of the better spears in wrestling because there's still quite a few people who use the spear right edge is still around 
for the longest time, it, it looked like he was hugging his opponent. It, w it was less of a spear and more of a hug. Although Edge, I feel like his spear has gotten better, actually, in recent, in recent years. But for my money, still, the best spear in wrestling, in the ring, Braun Breaker. I have not seen somebody with that much intensity look like they are truly just cutting their opponent in half when they hit them with that move. Since Goldberg, nobody does it better than Braun Breaker. He has mastered the art of making that move look as devastating as possible. He has the best spear in all of professional wrestling. The Lashleys here was able to pick up the win with his. There was a spot outside the ring when the Street Profits and the LWO were, were fighting, Montez Ford, I believe it was Montez, sent Cruz del Toro. I mean, he sent him, he ate the ring snaps face first. The way they, they, they shot this, this camera angle was perfect. It looked completely devastating. And just del Toro looked like he just ate the steps. And so he was down, Joaquin Wilde, uh, he was down as well. He took a beating to the point where when it was all over, they were calling for the medics to come out and check on the two of them. And it didn't at that point, it didn't look very well uh, or very good, I should say, for the LWO's chances tomorrow night because there's a six-man tag tomorrow at Fastlane. It was supposed to be, I believe, Escobar, Joaquin Wilde, and Cruz del Toro against Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits. So things at this point were not looking very good. We'll get back to this a little bit later on. We go to the back. Rhea Ripley and Paul Heyman are having a meeting of the minds. They're sitting down. They're facing each other just like this, just like you and me. I'm facing you. You're facing me. We can have one of those old staring contests like Conan used to have with Andy on his uh, late night show, but we'll do that some other time. So Heyman looked like he was contemplating something that they were discussing. And Rhea told him, come on, you're a wise man. So make the wise decision. We are stronger together. The Judgment Day and the Bloodline. Heyman said, I like it. He thinks it's brilliant. It's good. It's really good. And he excused himself to make a phone call. He was going to get this authorized. Just as he went to go dial, Rhea kind of pushed his hand down and asked him authorized. And Heyman said that he has to get this authorized by the tribal chief. Rhea said she's telling him it's authorized. Heyman said, sure, for the judgment day. But for the bloodline, it has to be authorized by the tribal chief. Rhea then told him, acknowledge me. Sounds a lot better when she says it. Heyman said that she's in the wrong locker room to say something like that. And she said that Heyman was going to acknowledge her uh, the way that his former boy Jay Uso acknowledged her on Raw Monday night, because Jay's got a little thing for Rhea. So we're going to find out who's stronger, the Judgment Day or the Bloodline, if he makes the wrong choice. And she says, now you're authorized to go make your little phone call. Rhea left. Heyman commanded his phone to call Roman Reigns. And I laugh at this idea because we've heard the Judgment Day on TV say this before, that there is no leader of the Judgment Day, right? There's no leader in this group. We're all equals, which has never been true. Various segments over the last several months, it's pretty clear who's wearing the pants in the Judgment Day, and it's Rhea Ripley. She's the one leading the charge. I don't see how you could watch this show tonight and think anything else other than Rhea Ripley is the leader of this group. As she goes, so goes the Judgment Day. Rhea, Rhea is the glue that holds the entire thing together. So she was great here. We had Austin Theory against Dragon Lee, who looks like he's been officially called up to the main roster. I mean, he could still make appearances, I suppose, in NXT, but he looks like he's, he's fully on the main roster. He's on the SmackDown brand. So that Raw match with Dominic last week, I mean, it was an impressive match, but clearly it left a big impression on management in WWE because uh, I don't know that they were planning on calling him up this quickly if this was the plan all along, but he had a great showing in that match. He was on NXT last week. He was on SmackDown. He was a special referee at No Mercy. 
He's been all over the place. And in every appearance, he has shined. Tonight was no different. Grayson Waller's music hit not even a minute into the match. He made his way down to the ring. Theory took advantage of the distraction. He attacked uh, Dragon Lee. Lee came back, hit a snap German. Waller got up on the apron, and Theory responded with a rolling drop kick to take control back. And at that point, the show went to a commercial break. Thank you, Samoan fan. Hey, there's French Fry Slut. We haven't seen French Fry Slut in a while. Thank you again if you're tuning in late. Thank you for all the birthday wishes. It uh, means a lot. I appreciate that. So we come back from the break. Theory went for another rolling move. Lee cut him off with a super kick. Lee hit a running drop kick. Theory worked his way back, though. Hit a spinning backbreaker for two. Lee hit a Liger Bomb for a near fall. And at that point, Waller distracted Dragon Lee, who got perched up on the top rope. He worked out of it, and Austin Theory ended up in a tree of woe. And then Lee hit this great-looking double stomp. Got some good height on it to Theory. Waller pulled Theory to safety outside. Lee, though, landed a flip dive before rolling Theory back in the ring. And as Dragon Lee was attempting to climb back into the ring, Waller grabbed him. Referee was not paying attention. He grabbed Dragon Lee and just rammed him headfirst into the apron and then put him back in the ring. Theory got all cocky. He's looking outside at Waller. He's giving him, you know, he's giving him the high sign and everything. And he picks him up on his shoulders. He's going to go for A-Town down. When Cameron Grimes shows up out of the crowd and he attacks Grayson Waller, that was enough to distract Theory and Dragon Lee rolled him up for the first win of his career on the main roster. Now, it came off of a distraction, which is not ideal, but a win is better than a loss. Because there were a few moments during this match where I actually thought they were going to beat Lee. A win is always better than a loss. This was not as good as the match that Dragon Lee had with Dominic on Raw last week. Uh, but this was another good outing for him. And I was also glad to see Cameron Grimes again. You know, we saw him back on TV last week after we haven't seen him in months. And I thought, okay, this, this is going to end up being a one-and-done situation. But obviously they have him, even if it's just a short-term thing, they have him now involved in something on this show, which is better than having him do absolutely nothing. So... I was happy to see him back on TV so soon after, and I guess they're setting up for a tag team match, whether it's next week or the week after, probably next week. Uh, we'll end up with Cameron Grimes and Dragon Lee. The two Lees, Trevor Lee and Dragon Lee, taking on Austin Theory and Grayson Waller. That is not yet official for next week, but I am sure that it will be. Now, I said I was going to get back to the Rey Mysterio LWO stuff, we go to the back. Mysterio was shown exiting the trainer's room, and he was informing Santos Escobar and Zelina Vega, who were very concerned, that Joaquin Wilde and Cruz del Toro would not be ready. There's no chance that they're going to be medically cleared and ready to be a part of the six-man tag at Fastlane tomorrow. And Vega begins to panic. What are we going to do? There's only two of us. There's three of them. And Ray's thinking about it, and he's thinking about it, and he has an idea. And he says, let me make a phone call. I'll take care of it. Now, when I saw what they did to Joaquin Wilde and Cruz del Toro, my first thought was Dragon Lee. And they even mentioned on commentary again how Rey Mysterio has put him over as the future of Lucha Libre, and you know, he's friendly with Dragon Lee. Dragon Lee's been featured so much lately, and he doesn't have a spot on the pay-per-view. I just thought, okay, they'll they'll turn to him, and it'll be Rey Mysterio, Santos, Escobar, and Dragon Lee. The moment that Rey said, let me make a phone call, that pretty much eliminated Dragon Lee, because why would he have to make a phone call if he's in the building? So it looks to me, and we'll find out tomorrow because they left it a mystery, uh, we're finally going to get the debut of Carlito. I've been waiting for this for months, ever since the, the news broke. I think it was Mike Johnson who said Carlito signed with WWE, and he was spotted at the Performance Center, and that was in July. He was going to make his debut on SmackDown at Madison Square Garden, and the Bloodline segment went 35 minutes that night, and so a bunch of things got bumped from the show. Whatever the case, uh, he's been signed, I believe, for at least two or three months while they have been waiting to figure out creatively what they want to do with him. 
him joining the LWO always made sense. When he made that cameo at Backlash in Puerto Rico, he came out to assist the LWO and Bad Bunny. Who else would it be? It's got to be Carlito. It's the name that makes the most sense. That should get a big pop. Might not be as big as, as the pop that he got in San Juan when they hit his music. But if they save it as a surprise and they don't let anybody know who it is until they hit the music, he's going to get a huge reaction tomorrow night. So it's about time we get him on the show. So the, this was very interesting, what happened next. The announcers were running down the card for the pay-per-view tomorrow night. And we got a preview package for the World Heavyweight title match, Last Man Standing, Seth Rollins, one-on-one -on -one with Shinsuke Nakamura. And I don't know how many of you picked up on something that Corey Graves said. As they were showing the match graphic, Corey Graves made this comment. He said, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was making the world forget that he existed. Now, it's from a movie. It's not a wrestling thing. But there was a certain wrestler who was famous for using that line in an old promo of his. And that wrestler was CM Punk. This is at least the third example in the last few weeks on television that there has been a CM Punk reference dropped in a promo, or in this case, on commentary. The other two times that I remember was Seth Rollins on Raw. Seth Rollins and Michael Cole had their segment in the ring on Monday night. There were references there to an old CM Punk Ring of Honor promo. Rollins a couple weeks ago said, when I'm 100%, the best in the world. It's a little too coincidental that we are getting all of these references. It's just a little too much of a coincidence. Now, it could just be them screwing around and messing with people. But there's no way that this is an accident. And I'm not saying that one is leading to the other. I'm just saying it's just very strange that this is at least the third time that I could think of in the last few weeks that we've gotten some sort of CM Punk reference. It is not a coincidence. And to the people mentioning MJF, again, MJF, not the first person. Not the first person to drop that reference in the devil stuff. It goes back. Punk, Punk was the first person I can remember to probably uh, use that in wrestling. MJF is, he's just pulling out uh, some of the old hits, some good material there that he's borrowing from people that used it before him. Anyway, I thought that was interesting in light of all the CM Punk news that we suddenly have floating around, which I'll talk more about on Sunday. Do I think he's going to be at Survivor Series? No, I don't, but we'll, we'll talk about that. LA Knight in the main event against Jimmy Uso. This was more of an angle than a match than anything else. A couple minutes in, both guys went for their finishers. They didn't get them. Action spilled outside where Jimmy hit a super kick and the show went to a commercial. When they came back from the... And yes, the, the usual suspects is an awesome move. It is indeed. If you have never seen The Usual Suspects, you should definitely go out of your way to see that movie. Good old Kaiser. Kaiser so. Back from the break night, hit a sunset flip from the apron to the ring, and this was kind of a unique spin on, on The Usual Sunset Flip. He came in, and when Jimmy fell backwards, he went backwards right into L.A. Knight's knees. At first, I thought maybe he botched the move. I think he meant to do it. Uh, he should incorporate that move into his arsenal, honestly. I thought it looked pretty cool. Knight hit a Russian leg sweep and a DDT before stomping him. Knight went to go lift him up. Uso got out until Knight caught him and hit a power slam. Then he did his jumping elbow off the ropes. Solo Sokoa at that point hit the ring to attack LA Knight, and that was the disqualification. So we get a DQ, and I'm looking at the clock, and it was 9.52. And I said, we have eight minutes left in this show. So what are they going to do? I had completely forgotten. And I even had it in, it's in the thumbnail of the video that, that we put together tonight. And I had totally forgotten the fact that up to this point, we had not seen Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso, who said on Monday that they would come to SmackDown on Friday. So I'm looking at the clock and I'm going, what, what the hell are they going to do here? They got eight minutes left in this show, not realizing that we still had some raw names who had not yet showed up. So John Cena ran out. He cleared the ring. Then we heard the Judgment Day theme. And the entire crew made their way out with J.D. McDonough. 
Rhea Ripley walked over to Paul Heyman and they shook hands. They smiled and they shook hands and Paul Heyman told her it has been authorized. So obviously he got the high sign from his boss. Cena and Knight, they stood in the ring all alone. They were outnumbered by the heels who were threatening to get into the ring when Jey Uso's music hit, right? Jey Uso comes down to the ring. Still outnumbered, though. John Cena, LA Knight, Jey Uso. Outside, you got Damian Priest. You got Solo Sokoa, Jimmy Uso, JD McDonough, Finn Balor, Dominic Mysterio, Rhea Ripley could probably beat these guys up, too. It's still, it's still too much. Then we hear Cody Rhodes music, and Cody runs down to the ring. Still not totally even, but now at least it's, you know, the sides were a little more even. And he joins with the baby faces. When they turned off Cody's music, the crowd just kept singing it. Because it was well before the, the, the part that everybody loves, you know, the woe. But they just kept singing the song, which I thought was funny. So a huge brawl erupted. Cody hit a suicide dive to the floor. Jay followed with a wild dive. Out over the top rope. Cena teased the dive, which I would pay good money to see. But Solo Sokoa got into the ring, so we never got the Cena dive. We had a face-off. Cena blocked a punch. He threw three of his own. Solo dropped him with a super kick. LA Knight got into the ring. He avoided a Samoan spike, and he clotheslined Solo out to the floor. JD McDonough gets into the ring. LA Knight drops him with a BFT. He then gets super kicked by Jay Uso. John Cena picks him up, slams him down, gives him the five knuckle shuffle, and then gives him an attitude adjustment. Cody removes his weightlifting belt. He hits crossroads. And they played Cody's music, and the baby faces stood tall to end the show. Poor Funko Pop Head McDonough was the punching bag for all the baby faces here at the end of this segment. But it was a crowd pleasing conclusion to what I thought overall was a good show. Uh, some good hype for Fastlane heading into tomorrow night, including this new alliance, which I think is, is intriguing to a lot of people. This new, I'm sure, short-lived alliance between the Bloodline and the Judgment Day going into the pay-per-view. How is that going to affect the show? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about where this is going, where I think this may be going tomorrow night. I'm looking at what we have on the car. We have Finn Balor and Damian Priest, they're going to be defending their undisputed tag team titles against Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso, two people who have absolutely no business being tag team champions. And I do not believe they will be tag team champions. So then how do Balor and Priest walk away with the win? Because you know they're not going to win straight up, right? Well, we have this newfound partnership between the two factions, right? It's been authorized. I think what we'll get, we are going to get Solo Sokoa, and Jimmy Uso. We're going to have the Bloodline, with the assist, help the Judgment Day retain the tag team titles. So they're going to hold up their end of the deal. And then we're going to get to the main event. John Cena and LA Knight against Solo and Jimmy. And there's going to come a point in that match where they expect that favor to be paid back. And when the Judgment Day tries to help, and tries to pay back that favor, it backfires. And John Cena and LA Knight go on to win the match. LA Knight will probably be the one to pin Solo, or not Solo, but uh, Jimmy Uso, because they're very protective of Solo Sokoa. And so it will not work out the way that they had intended, because the Judgment Day got what they wanted, the Bloodline did not. So now we have drama, because what is the fallout going to be between these two groups? What is the fallout going to be now when Roman Reigns shows up on SmackDown next week and he is none too happy about what happened to Fastlane? That's how I see this playing out. I think it'll work out for one group and not for the other. But there's also another possibility here. You know, you look beyond Fastlane, you look towards Survivor Series, and if we are going to get a War Games match, and again, maybe that's what Triple H is going to announce next week, what would the lineup look like for War Games if the Judgment Day and the Bloodline were involved? Because, yeah, I've been looking at this the whole time a little bit differently. I've been looking at this as a Raw-only War Games, where you have all the members of the Judgment Day, including J.D. McDonough, 
taking on Cody and Jay and KO and Sammy and maybe Drew McIntyre joins with them. Uh, or maybe it's just four on four. And now I can envision a scenario where we have a three-way. It's the amazing Goonthar. Jerry Lawler loves Goonthar, the Magnificent. All hail Goonthar. All hail Goonthar. Hey, Deontay Swanye dropping a $50 Goonthar bomb. Thank you very much. Deontay uh, sent me a very nice message earlier. So, Deontay, thank you. I'm going to be reading your message here in a little bit. But to finish this thought, a three-way war games where you have the bloodline, you have the judgment day, and then you have your team of babyfaces. Three against three against three. We've seen it before. The very first war games that NXT did back in, I want to say, 2017 was a three-way match. Undisputed Era. I know uh, it was what was it AOP maybe and and Roddy may have been on their team and I think it was uh, Sanity. You had three against three against three, so we could see a similar thing here where you have Roman Reigns, Jimmy Uso, and Solo Sokoa against Finn Balor, Damian Priest, Dominic Mysterio, and on the babyface side you have Cody Rhodes, you have Jay Uso. And you have, look, it could be anyone. It could be Drew McIntyre. It could be LA Knight. Because John Cena by that point is done. So you could have Cody, Jay, and LA Knight. You could have Cody, Jay, and Drew. And that's where maybe Drew, maybe he walks out on his team. Because we could see the heel turn coming. And we know Drew McIntyre has an issue with Cody Rhodes. Because Cody is the one who brought Jay to Raw. Drew does not like Jay Uso. So there could be some drama there that they play up. You could you could plug anybody, honestly, in the third spot. It wouldn't really matter. Uh, so that's that's kind of what I'm wondering now. If we're looking at this wrong, and if we get war games, it's not necessarily four on four or five on five. It could be teams of three. And you get the two factions in there and your team of baby faces, and you have all these different stories unfolding and playing out in war games. So I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued to see where this goes. Now, this is not the first time that we have had an alliance form between these two groups. I believe earlier this year uh, was it coming out of WrestleMania, I think. I think there was some sort of a truce or some sort of an alliance that was forged uh, for one week anyway with the Judgment Day and the Bloodline. So this is this is the second time, I think, that we're seeing something like this. Um, but I think it's a smart way to reel people in for the pay-per-view tomorrow, and it makes things for Survivor Series a little more interesting. We'll see if we get the official War Games announcement next week or not, because Triple H will be on the show. And as I mentioned before, Roman Reigns, for the first time since SummerSlam, will also be back on the show next Friday, which, of course, I will not be here for. There will be no SmackDown stream next week for the season premiere, because next week is Friday the 13th, and a very special House of Glory show. So, naturally, they're loading up SmackDown next week. Of course they are. Of course they are. Here's the poll. Almost 80% thumbs up. 21.5% thumbs down. Get those votes on in. At Solomonster on Twitter. Look at that guy. Look at that. Look at Genie Solo. Genie Solo Monster. I just call myself Solo Monster? Why, why do I call myself Solo Monster? <laughs> so, Genie Solo Monster. That's what I meant. Uh, X Mega, yes. House of Glory in New York. New York City. Buy a ticket. NYC Arena, or you can watch it on Premier Streaming Network. It'll be streaming live. As long as we have working internet this time. Let's hope that doesn't happen again. Let's check out your Super Chats here on this uh, happiest of birthdays. Again, I want to thank you guys for hanging out with me here on my birthday, keeping me company like you guys always do. Uh, we got Rob G. What is the best and worst Michael Myers mask? A very appropriate question here in the month of October. Uh, easily, it's Halloween 5. Halloween 4 didn't have a great one either, but Halloween 4 I actually liked. 
Halloween 5, that mask is just it's garbage. Absolute garbage. It's too big. Even. The, I forgot the name of the um, no, Shanks. I got the guy's name. The guy who was under the mask in the uh, suit. Like, the mask is so big, it's got, like, flaps around the neck, and it's it's just, it's it doesn't look like Michael Myers. Terrible mess. Awful. Garbage. Garbage. Lady Firepanda says, Happy 54th birthday, Solomon. I, I think I look good for 54. I think I look pretty good. The Winston Slip. Happy birthday, Solo. Rank your favorites, Edge, Christian, Jericho. Talking all time here? I would go Jericho, I would go Christian, and I would go Edge. I think that's how I would rank it for me. The Real CSO 2, do you think one reason for the talent cuts a week or so ago was to make room for more big signings like a Jade Cargill or potentially CM Punk? No, I just think that they, again, cuts are always a part of these types of deals. They were going to happen regardless of who they do or do not sign. Now, if getting rid of a bunch of people clears some payroll for them to go ahead and sign people, then it just works out that way. But do I think that's why they made the cuts? No. I Look, everyone, it's Samoa Bro. Those cuts were happening no matter what. Hey, Zachariah, thank you, man, for the Samoa Bro. Jamie Dorsch with the $20 super. Hulk Hogan's unknowingly gave you an early birthday gift in the form of another lie in the news about a planned Shane McMahon-Nick Hogan match. At least he was honest that he cannot wrestle anymore. Happy birthday. Thank you, Jamie. That was a... Uh, I, I did watch... Uh, I haven't finished it yet. But Chris always does great interviews. And so Chris had the chance to sit down for about an hour uh, with Hulk Hogan. And I know this is not his first interview he's done with Hogan. But he did a very good job with it. But of course, it would not be a Hogan interview without some Hoganisms in it. So this interview was no different. It's always good for some great entertainment. Uh, Frode79 says, Happy birthday, bro. Thank you, Fro, for the bro. The Winston Slip, what are some underrated entrance songs? Rob Conway always had a catchy theme. I was kind of pissed off at how catchy it was. But as far as underrated themes, I always liked Alberto Del Rio's theme. No words to it, it's just an instrumental, but I don't think that gets enough love. Chris AXC, happy birthday. Who wins in a shoot, Brock or Vader? Brock, as somebody who was a trained fighter, I would... Well, I, I would go Brock. I think Brock was just such... You know, Vader was an absolute monster. He was a beast. He was a big dude who could throw down. And I would not want to be anywhere near a Vader fight. Brock, even when he was younger, was just an athletic freak. I just... Oh, speaking of freaks. Uh, Sean Nelson, wow. Okay. Brimo, yes. Wow. It says, happy birthday, Sean. Thank you. Brock was just such a freak. I think he would have. I think he would have been able to take Vader down and have his way with him. Honestly, even before he was trained and fought in the UFC, I think Brock was so strong and so quick, and he had that amateur wrestling background. I gotta go, Brock. And besides, you know, Vader. Vader got uh, his ass kicked by Paul Orndorff in flip flops once in WCW. So I think that kind of hurt his rep a little bit. Chris also says, with the rumors about Punk and WWE talking, do you really think it's possible we see Punk back in WWE? If so, who do you think he works first? Yeah, it's possible. Of course it's possible. I think a lot of what we've been hearing about, honestly, is Punk um, floating his own reports, trying to get things sparked, trying to float interest on his part from his camp, trying to get something going. I don't know that there have been talks at all between the two sides. I mean, I think Meltzer said there was. I'm I'm reading and hearing other things from other sources. Uh, we do have Survivor Series coming up in Chicago. I'm sure it would be very tempting, but 
I'm not convinced that there is anything going on at the moment. I think Punk wants there to be. I absolutely think Punk wants to go back to WWE because where else is he going to go? I think he wants to go back. I don't know that WWE is as enthusiastic, but that doesn't mean that at some point they won't talk and they won't be able to come to some kind of agreement. If he does come back, who does he work first? I could see him working Seth Rollins first. The Mount Vernon kid, Christopher Bennett. Uh, my little brother, Hulkling93, and I just want to wish you a happy birthday. Cheers to another trip around the sun. Keep shining. Well, thank you very much. And tell Hulk, I don't know if Hulkling is uh, with us or not, but tell him I appreciate that. Raphael, happy birthday, Solomon, sir. Raphael, thank you. Thank you for the five. The Real CS says, man, I love pro wrestling. I can't even remember the last time I was more proud to be a fan than now. Both WWE and AEW are killing it. See, that's the right attitude to have. There's a lot of good stuff going on right now in wrestling. A lot to be uh, excited about. Roger Penlin, happy birthday. I was, I was a channel member for just under two years. But my former work screwed me up for a bit that's all fine and well because i'm back and it's good to have you back roger roger has been one of the long time listeners so i hope roger's doing well base beer says happy birthday thank you for the 12 for making him productions happy birthday jason Voorhees. i mean solomon you're thinking of next friday i'm kind of pissed i won't be here honestly next friday friday the 13th i always enjoy those streams how often does Friday the 13th come along in October? It doesn't happen very often. I'm sad that I'm going to miss it. Rodimus Prime, thank you for the birthday love. Hope you enjoyed it, he says. I did. I did indeed. Hype Man Slimy. I realized it was because it was my birthday. It was because it was on my calendar since last year. Just want to show... Uh, how much you mean to me here's to my favorite youtuber hype man slimy thank you very much very very nice of you. damien the fiend in the chat it's not belated yet it's still my birth it says happy belated it's still technically my birthday it's not midnight yet 16 entertainment again thank you for that flare drop uh the juliet Nice belt you have on the wall. Hope your day was wonderful. Yeah, it was Steve. Steve with us. He'll be very happy to see you. I told you I was going to bust it out again one of these days. There's the Sala Monster belt over my shoulder right there. Looks even better up close. Darius Smith, NXT WrestleMania next week. Yes. Are you excited for NXT WrestleMania? We have WrestleMania Backlash last year. Now we have NXT WrestleMania. Lady Fire Panda, thank you for the five. Jace Chua with the seven bucks. First time donator. Been a listener since 2017. Always, a, what is that? One, two, three, four, five. That's a long time. Uh, always love your podcast and your videos. Thank you for your knowledge and passion. Also, happy birthday. More power to you. Jace, with the first time donation. Thank you, sir. Since 2017. It's a long time. There's Steve. There's Steve Mello. That design you see right there, the design of the, of the Solid Monster belt. It's all from his brain. All from his Canadian brain. Two best things to come out of Canada, bacon and Steve Mello. There you go. Look Red Heart would be number it's three. Samoa Bro. Samoa Bro, I'll get to you in a second, Samoa Bro. Darth Panic, thank you for the $22. French Fry Slut, happy spooky month and happy birthday. It's my favorite month. What's not to like about October? You get great weather. I mean, the other day it was 77 degrees here in New York. Now it's going to go down into the 50s next week. But you get good weather. It's my birthday. In my eye. Tear in my eye. Halloween. What's not to like? Samoan fan. 
Have you seen the card for Bound for Glory? We have Osprey and Kenta on the same card, and the day after, we get Will Osprey against Josh Alexander. I did not see the full card, but uh, I did hear about that. Osprey is just all over the place. How many match of the year contenders is that guy going to have by the time this year is over? Holy shit. Brother Fluff Salisbury, thank you for the birthday love. Hey, Ishmael, how's your dad? How's your dad? Slim Yoshi with the $10 super chat. Happy birthday, Solomon Monster. Hope tonight has been a good one for you, and hopefully tomorrow will be a fun show. I hope so, too. Looking forward to Fast Lane tomorrow. Not the strongest card they've done on pay-per-view, but their their pay-per-view year has been very, very strong. And AEW's as well. We've been very spoiled by these pay-per-views this year. Halen's Haven. Happy birthday, brother. Single H. Oh, my goodness. Halen. Haven't heard from you in a while. Halen from the Facebook group. What's going on? Thank you for the $9.99. Ah. We're having a party here on the street. We're Barry Horowitz now. Where is it? You know, when I knew I was going to have a party tonight, I said, you can't have a party without hiring a DJ. You got to hire a DJ to come in. Everybody get everybody on the dance floor, get everybody excited and happy. And so I hired ABK to be my hype man here for the stream, and he did not disappoint. He did not disappoint. I didn't even, you know what, I was I was so into it in the moment, I didn't even see the amount, but I'm sure it was something huge. So, ABK, <laughs> I'll get to your message in a little bit, but I'm sure that was a bomb. Thank you for the bomb. I don't take those for granted. That is very kind of you. And uh, I'm very happy that you can join us here today. It's never really a party until ABK shows. Then things get really fun. Uh, there's Deontay. Deontay Swanye. It's your number one Sky Blue fan. You may have some competition from the people in the chat. Amazing time to be a wrestling fan as a fan of AEW and WWE. I am happy about Tuesday, but Solomon Monster, my guy. I just want to say happy birthday, brother. I wish you the best. You deserve even more. All love. Deontay, thank you very much for the 50 bucks. I, uh, I appreciate that, and I appreciate your message from earlier. You're one of you're one of the good ones. Sam Rizza became a sound off superstar. Welcome to Sam. Base Beerus need that new Christian super chat. Go. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to play uh, any actual audio from AEW because their their automated system on YouTube is very strict. But. We might be able to do something as far as a visual super chat. It's possible. Like the two of them hugging or something. and You know. It, it, it should be censored, though. I don't want to put the actual word on screen. But I'm sure we can whip something up. Zachariah, happy birthday, Solo. Uh, Mr. Ozone. Mr. Ozone just did a drive-by. Hey, Bobby's World, thank you for the gift. Thank you for the gift. Zachariah says, that uh, happy birthday to one of the goats that gets us through the day. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you being on all my streams. Zachariah is with us multiple times every single week. Loyal to a fault. Uh, LPH is good. Happy birthday from LPH. $5 super chat. Thank you, LPH. Sean Nilsson. What's going on, Sean? Thank you for the Bree mode. Down bad. It's a happy birthday. You are the man. I'm sure Tony Khan and Vince sent you gifts for carrying water for both companies. I haven't even opened them yet. They're in a box downstairs. They have not even been unsealed. 
That's all they do is send stuff to my house. It's annoying. Will Chisholm. I don't know if Punk is coming in, but all of his teases had to do with Seth Rollins. We know Seth has been wanting a match with Punk for years. It's like I mentioned before, the other teases were directly mentioned by Rollins. This one was mentioned by Corey Graves, but it was in reference to the Rollins match. There's no way this is not being done on purpose. And it could just be them, again, just messing around with people. It does not mean Punk is coming in. I do believe, though, if Punk comes in, if I had to say, okay, who do I think the first person is for him to work with? I think it ends up being Seth Rollins. I think it could be Punk and Rollins for the World Heavyweight title. Daniel Malcolm, happy birthday, brother man. Thank you, Daniel. Samoan fan, what did you think of Scream and all of the sequels? Um, I like this. I, the original Scream is one of my favorite movies. I love it. I just love the whole tone of it, um, the feel of it, the music, the soundtrack. I you know, Marco Beltrami, all that stuff. I love it. The second one I thought was good. I should probably go back and watch that. I haven't seen that one in years. Third one, eh. I mean, progressively, I probably liked liked them less and less. Um, the one that I saw, not the most recent one, but the one before that from last year, um, I enjoyed that one. It just got progressively more ridiculous, though. The one in New York, the one they just did in Manhattan, uh, I thought that was good. But none of them are as good as the original. The original is easily the best one. Wes Craven, man. I miss Wes Craven. Face Beerus Lesnar used to belly to belly Big Show. Insane. Yeah, Big Show, when he was feuding with Brock in 02 and 03, I mean, his body, him and Heyman both, because Heyman was taking bumps off the F5 in dark matches every week after SmackDown. I mean, the two of them got just half beaten to death working with Brock. Rumplemane, happy birthday, Solo the Monster. Thank you, Rumpel. B Money 04, happy birthday. Will you be checking out the new Saw movie? Uh, I'm not going to drag myself to the theater to see it, but when it comes out and I can watch it at home, I might check it out. I just feel like I have to go, I have to see some of the, the other recent ones before I see this one, or maybe I don't. Maybe I don't have to. I don't know. Do you need to have seen the most recent ones to, to see the new one? I know it's gotten great reviews. It's actually gotten very positive reviews. Uh, Rizzo, I miss you guys. I've been busy with work, but I listen to all the podcasts still. I love how WWE and AEW make each other try harder with their product. Tuesday is going to be a great night for the fans. It will be. Absolutely will be. And that's the right attitude to have. None of this us versus them nonsense. It's just embarrassing. Zachariah Sitchin with the 1999 says, Something I caught back in 2011. Edge, I mean Adam, turned his back on Christian for his antics winning the World Heavyweight Championship. And then now Christian does the same to Edge, I mean Adam. He holds grudges. Talk about long-term storytelling. It's a good point. Anderson Blitz, happy birthday. October will be a fun month. Yeah, plus October, you also got playoff baseball. Put that on the list too. Reasons why October is the best month of the entire year. M Mills says, happy birthday. M Mills, thank you for the 1992. Thank you very much. Uh, Ishmael with the 499, I was at the AEW show in Stockton. Happy to have a live televised show in Stockton for the first time since 95 when Vader attacked Gorilla. Is that the first time? And it wasn't 95, it was 96. That was the that was the Raw the night after the Royal Rumble. Because I think that Royal Rumble was in Was it Sacramento? Royal Rumble 96 was in California. I know that. And the next night, yeah, they would have been in Stockton. Uh, that's when Vader attacked Gorilla Mons. That was a great angle, too. But Vader was hurt, and he needed shoulder surgery the day after he debuted in the Royal Rumble. So that was their way of writing him off television with a suspension. But 
they didn't keep him out very long. They didn't keep him out very long. He was back for WrestleMania. He was not 100%. And that probably affected his entire run in WWE. I don't know that he was ever fully healthy. He didn't have enough time to heal up the shoulder. Fresno. Thank you, Kevin. He's in Fresno. Fresno was the Rumble, and then Stockton would have been Raw the next night. Uh, the Real CS says, I hate the edge. Is a traitor talk just because he went to AEW? WWE are more than happy for it. Agreed. Uh, we got Ishmael again. Also, I got to meet Tony Khan, the Hardys, Jake Hager, and others. The show was super fun to watch live. I will be at the November 8th Rampage and Collision taping in Oakland. We'll have fun. Brandy, yes, you are correct. That's right. Maybe that's what I was thinking of. 93 was in Sacramento. That was at the Arco, I believe. The Arco Arena. ABK says, happy birthday, Solo. You know what I forgot? You know, it's how, can, how do you have a birthday and not drop uh, confetti? Did I lose it? No, I didn't. Right here. We got, we got to drop confetti. It's a party here. We got, we got. Look at this. We got half naked solo in a birthday cap. You got to drop some confetti. Now it's a party. Now it's a party. ABK, thank you for that two hundred and five dollar bomb. You are the man. I don't know what else to say, man. You blow me away every single time. You really do. Just when I think he can't impress me, he goes out there and does that. Corey Blake says, Happy birthday to the great Sala Monster. Many more blessings. Let me move it up here. Here we go. So everybody can see it. Now everybody can't see it. <laughs> so much for that. Many more blessings your way. Wanted to ask, when do you think Kevin Owens will turn on Sami Zayn again? Also, if Hogan stayed around in 92, do you think him and Flair at Survivor Series or, uh, I guess, SummerSlam? SummerSlam 92, since Flair did not have a match. Hard to say, uh, because they didn't even know. I'm going to say no, just because they could have done it at WrestleMania. And they opted not to, in part because they didn't feel that it was box office but also they knew Hogan was going to go away. So they weren't going to put the title on him. And obviously they weren't going to let Flair be. So I, I honestly don't know that they would have done the match even at Wembley. I just think, you know, based on, I guess, based on the house show run, they just didn't feel that it was a, a, a big enough main event to draw on pay-per-view. Although you could have easily done it on the Wembley show because it didn't even headline the show. They did Warrior and Savage. So, yeah, you could have done Hogan and Flair in the middle of the show, let's say, for the championship. Uh, I just don't know that they would have wanted to, honestly. As far as when Owens turns on Zayn, I think there's a chance it could happen before WrestleMania. I think there's a chance. It's absolutely going to happen next year. I, I just don't know if they'll... Uh, Pull the trigger on that before Mania or wait until after. It would be a shame for them to do it before, though, just because now we have DIY back together. I want DIY against Owens and Zayn. I have to see that. They have to do that match before they do the turn. So hold off until then. That's, that is what my request would be. Hold off until then. Uh, Mr. Ozone with the 25 bucks. Happy birthday. Is Undertaker also at NXT with that gong? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Although he has said that you will not see him showing up as the Undertaker anymore. Like he's retired as the Undertaker. So he'll probably just walk out there as himself. I don't know if he'll ride a motorcycle because he doesn't have very far to go. It's a small, it's a small area. He may just walk out looking like the American badass and that's it. I'm not expecting much. So I uh, do not expect him to be in his full Undertaker garb. Oh, it's JM with the dancing robot. Very appropriate here for this birthday stream. Look at him go. 
Ants is better than me. JM with a $150 super chat bomb. JM, you know how to make a, uh, an old man, an old man feel good. JM, I appreciate your support for all these years, all these streams. It really means a lot. Thank you very much. I will, I will get to you in a second. Marco, listener since 2013. What a better way to lose my super chat virginity. Happy birthday, solo goat. Are you saying you lost your virginity to me? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. It's a little weird, but... Thank you, Marco. I can't think of a better way for you to lose your super chat virginity either. I'm proud it could be me. Rizzo, why did the coffee file a police report? It got mugged. Rizzo, thank you. Juan Ocampo, happy birthday to you, my man. Another year closer towards your AARP card. To quote Vince, since you are getting older, life sucks and then you die. That may have been the most honest thing I've heard all day. You're not wrong. Thank you, Juan, for that inspirational message. Boney with the 10 bucks. Remembering when Christian debuts in AEW, people described it as overhyped. Uh, that was when he came out and said, outwork everyone. Looking back on it now, were these feelings fair? And has he earned the hype with his time there and all he has achieved? I think there were a lot of people who, when Christian debuted, were not necessarily his biggest fan and didn't see him as a huge major league acquisition, even though he had been to all these other places, WWE and TNA. It's like, oh, okay, they got Christian, but it's not, he's not like a big star, right? And the reality is, compared to some of the other big stars they've signed, whether it's CM Punk or Adam Copeland or people like that, Christian is not looked at as that level, like that big of a name. But what Christian has a tendency to do, I think, because people sort of um, underrate him in many ways, is he ends up going out there and I think he overachieves. And he has this habit of one day he'll just sort of come up behind you and like, it's like he smacks you in the back of the head like, wow, I didn't realize like, like Christian's, he's really good. Like, yeah, no shit. So Christian is on this just incredible run as a heel right now in AEW. And the matches he's had, even when he was still a babyface, remember when he beat Kenny Omega? And he won the, uh, the the Impact World title. I think it was on Rampage. They had that great match on television. Everybody went nuts when he pinned Omega. He gave him a kill switch onto a chair. It was this great moment. Like, he's had a pretty impressive resume of matches, whether it's the match with Omega, the rematch between them at All Out that they did, I think, a few weeks later. Um, some of the television matches recently with Darby. The match with Darby at Wrestle Dream. Christian is on fire as the TNT champion. And I think when we look back on his career, when he's finally done, I'm hoping that he will get the, the flowers that he deserves from the people who maybe didn't look at him the same way they did an Edge or someone like that. You know, you hear people say, who's the Michaels and who's the Janetti of a tag team? And I'm sure a lot of people have said that about Christian. Edge is the Michaels, Christian is the Janetti. No. And I, I think that's a total slap in the face to Christian. They have both gone on to have super successful careers and be world champion. How can you say that? How can you honestly say that? He, he's nothing like Marty Jannetty. Look at the body of work. Look at the, the titles and the accomplishments in different promotions, not even just WWE. Christian has built a Hall of Fame resume for 
and I'm glad that there are some people who are finally waking up to that fact. Christian is great. He always was. Just didn't really get the credit for it. Now it's cool to see that he is. Lady Fire Panda, thank you for the super chat. Paul Carpenter, rest in peace. Dick Buttkiss, that's not how you spell it. Butcher, the, yeah, you did. But uh, thank you for the sentiment, though. Yeah, this was not a good week for the WrestleMania 2 Battle Royal. Dick Buttkiss and Russ Francis passed away within days of each other. Cody Moore, happy birthday to the hardest working man in the sports entertainment. I sound like Bret Hart now. I threw an extra the in there. Uh, name three wrestlers you would want to take on a week-long vacation with me. <clears throat> Uh, three wrestlers I would like to take on a vacation with me. Okay. How about we do Tony Storm? We do... Let's see. Who else? Who else do I want to take on a vacation with me? Tony Storm. Rhea Ripley. Tony Storm. Rhea Ripley. And I will say... Hmm. Who should, who should the third person be? Who should the third person be? I wonder. Jamie Hayter. How about that? Tony Storm, Jamie Hayter, and Rhea Ripley. Those are my three picks. Oh, Jade, you know what? I forgot about that. Yeah, I, I, yeah you know? You got a good point there with Jade, but I can only pick three. So We'll have a good time. It's going to be a good vacation. You guys, you you guys can have uh, go go take Ricky Starks, go take CM Punk, go take your Jack Perry. Enjoy, have fun. Samoan fan, for your birthday, you need to pick up some chicks. I just did. I picked up three of them. Didn't you hear me? Jamie Hader, Tony Storm, and Rhea Ripley. Matt McClure. 20 bucks. Happy birthday. Thank you for the years of coverage. Praying over this next year for you. It's very kind of you, Matt. Thank you for the uh, $20 and the very nice words. I hope the same for you over this next year. Rizzo, they could be trolling, but they also did the same teases for Cody before he returned. For the first time since he left in 2014, I think Punk is coming back. Rizzo says, happy uh, birthday, by the way. See you all tomorrow. That's right. We, we're going to be back here for Fastlane tomorrow night. We can extend the birthday celebration. This whole weekend is my birthday. This is my birthday weekend. I have declared this my birthday weekend. Uh, Kiddo Hudson, Scream is the most consistent horror franchise. It is probably better than most actual horror movie franchises. Some of them just delve into the just the absolute most over the top, unfunny, you know, just nonsensical garbage. At least with Scream, I mean, I may not like some of those movies as much as the original, but there's some good ones in there. And I don't know that there's really a an absolutely horrible screen movie it's just that some rank better than others uh hbkc83 all the way from hollis queens to you in brooklyn happy birthday enjoy your weekend and more importantly enjoy it safely i shall do my best am i going live on tuesday of course i'm going live on tuesday why wouldn't i go live on tuesday i'm either going to cover dynamite or i'm going to try to cover both shows Either way, you're going to get me on Monday, you're going to get me on Tuesday. Matter of fact, you got me tonight, you got me tomorrow night for Fastlane. You got a podcast on Sunday, you got the Raw stream on Monday, and you got me live on Tuesday. Then you won't get me live again until the following Monday. But that's a nice stretch there of content that you got coming. Cody Moore, name three wrestlers I would want to do a haunted house with. 
Tony Storm, Jamie Hayter, and Rhea Ripley. Samoan fan, Lesnar having his way with Vader, not a, <laughs> not a good image. <laughs> hey, he, if he wants to, he can do whatever he wants, pretty much. Not a good image, he says. Hey, some people might enjoy it. You never know. It says, who is the best and worst scream killer? I don't want to do spoilers. We'll, we'll avoid that. Kiddo Hudson says, uh, happy B-Day. Thank you very much. Thank you, kiddo. Paul Carpenter, we may get the brood reunion rumor. They were going to bring in Gangrel. Or did they? Maybe they did bring him in. Oh, no, they, well, did they? No, I think they were going to, but they didn't. Is that what happened? You got all three of them. I, I guess if they wanted to make it happen, eventually they can. Emilio, thank you very much. I appreciate the five bucks. Halen's Haven. I've been a shadow supporter since the Facebook days. Those were golden times. Met some great friends. I've still been listening. Appreciate you. I appreciate you as well. Those were those were good times. It's going back a ways too. Those, those Facebook days were, were probably going back close to a decade now. It was a while ago. JM with that hundred and fifty dollar bomb. Appreciate your excellent work on the podcast and live streams. You're a jam up guy. Here's a little something towards bringing Katrina in as a guest commentator for the next hog show. I'm gonna have to work on that. Oh man, I forgot about Katrina. Maybe she would. You know what? Especially with that character that she portrayed in Lucha Underground, she would probably be a better choice to take with me to the haunted house. So maybe we'll leave. Uh, we'll leave. Uh, uh, we'll leave Tony Storm out of that one. We'll bring Katrina with us. I think that would be fun. Hey JM, again, thank you, man. Thank you for the hundred and fifty. Very, very, very kind of you. Sean with the 499 happy birthday WWE is telling good stories Rhea is such a star one bad thing is Bailey is losing way too much you are the best yeah Bailey has taken a back seat you know right now the the focus is on EO as the champion but their story is still going to play out and end up with EO against Bailey I don't think she's going to necessarily win the title and then you'll have the inevitable Bailey babyface turn at some point. The only question is, do they give her back the Bailey buddies, or has she outgrown them? I guess that would feel like a step backwards for her. Samoan fan, we all lost our virginity to you. Don't go spreading rumors now. What do you think I am, Ric Flair? You know how many? Uh... I don't even want to give. I don't even want to give the visual. gonna say something but I'll keep it to myself Michaela happy birthday your podcast get me through long shifts at work keep up the great work I will do my best any way that I can help pass the time Rizzo mine is Jade Scarlet and Liv it's not a bad trio at all not a bad trio Dr. Bropio Jason in space is better than Halloween franchise happy birthday so well now i just know you're troll jm well katrina just turned down the commentary gig since you left her off the vacation list message delivered by christian with a turtle i only forgot about her because we just haven't seen her around she hasn't been you know on television i haven't i don't even know what she's up to Samoan fan burner account says no Judy Bagwell. No. Judy is off doing her uh, pole dancing or whatever it is that she's doing. Kevin uh, with the 999. Thank you for the birthday wishes. And Samoan fan. Got to mention Christian put over Josh Alexander at Bound for Glory two years ago. Led to the great Moose Angle. But Christian is great is a great wrestler, such a pro. Absolutely. Christian, he just, he gets it, you know? He, he just, he gets it. He gets the little things right. 
And again, this run that he has been on has been incredibly fun. You know, he got hurt there. He tore, was it the triceps that he tore? And he was gone for a very long time. But since he's come back, you know, the guy's been on a tear. It's not like he's wrestling every week. He doesn't have to. Uh, but just his, his character, his presence on the show has just been a breath of fresh air. Hey, it's Hydrograd chiming in some birthday love been listening almost nine years and haven't missed a single episode since we appreciate you brother if you had to choose one horror movie franchise to get rid of what would it be hmm. franchise to get rid of well we're going to keep halloween and Friday the 13th, and Nightmare on Elm Street. I'm not even really a Freddy guy, but you know, we'll keep that. Saw, Scream. <laughs> I'm inclined to say Texas Chainsaw Massacre just because there's just there's been so many of them, it's kind of annoying at this point. I don't know that I have a horror movie franchise that just bothers me so much, though. I'd like to wipe it off the face of the earth. No, I can't think of one that bothers me that much. Chucky? No, Chucky doesn't bother me. Chucky's another one where I think it, it just kind of gets ridiculous after a while. Leprechaun? Oh, come on, Leprechaun. Leprechaun is like, it's so bad, it's good. You ever saw Leprechaun in the hood? Come on. That's cinema. Cinema. Richie says, does the draft really matter now? I don't know where you've been. The draft, the, the draft hasn't mattered since probably two weeks after the draft. No, it doesn't matter anymore. Dr. Bropio, all serious though. Happy birthday and thank you for the laughs. I could say the same for you. Thank you, Dr. Bropio. Creep show is, you know, Creep show is a favorite of mine. I watched the uh, the TV series. I don't know if they're still doing it anymore. I haven't heard anything about a new season. Um, but yeah, I, I watched the, the the show when they started running episodes in the last few years. I'm, I'm a big creep show guy. Emilio, again in Battle Creek. That would imply that I've ever been to Battle Creek, brother. The Hulkster only makes the big towns, brother. <laughs> Thank you, Emilio. Final Destination, I, I think I've seen bits and pieces. I, I don't think I've ever seen a full Final Destination movie from start to finish. Uh, pin, you know what? Jeremy, you make a good point. Pinhead, I never got into the Lawnmower Man pinhead stuff. If I had to pick one. You know what? If I had to pick one, I might go Hostel. I don't know how many of them they did. I, I just... That was never for me. Um, Pinhead, though, I I never I never bothered with Pinhead. I never bothered with Candyman either. Never 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 got into it. Is the news? Is there a new season of Creep Show coming? Let me know because I I just haven't even been thinking about it, and I have heard nothing about it. I would love to know if there is a new season coming and where it's airing because I'd like to check that out. But if it was coming out soon, it would make sense, being October and all. So it could be premiering soon, if that's the case. Oh, so there's only been two Hostel movies? Good. Let, let, let there only be two. See No Evil is the same thing. There were only two of them. And I, and I did see both of them. All right, there it is. Creep Show is coming back on Shutter, new season. Now I just have to, I have to find out the date. Well, I'm very happy to hear that. I did not know about that. Uh, did I watch the Creep Show movies? Yes, and the uh, first one is is one of my favorites. The only one that I always avoided was the, you know, in the in the Creep Show movie they have the, you know, 
different story. I think there's like five different stories, four or five different stories in the movie. And I always avoid the last one. With the with the bug guy, I can't. I I that's not for me. But the rest of the movie, I love it. I love it. The one with uh Leslie Nielsen and Ted Danson, uh the monster in the crate under the stairs. Just I love it. I love it. Stephen King and in, in uh with the alien life form that falls to earth and then he turns into a giant plant. <laughs> I'm all about that. I love it. I love that movie. I think that movie may have come out the same year I was born now that I think about it. Richie with the five bucks coming in soon. Who got more buried as a horror icon, Michael or Chucky? Well, Considering they put Michael in there up against the Buster Rhymes, I'd say it got a little ridiculous with with Michael. I might have to go Michael. Uh, was the raft in Creep Show or Tales from the Crypt? Oh, um, that might have been Creep Show too. You talking about the one where um, they're on like a boat dock, and I know one of the deaths is someone I think gets sucked below, and like you see the ring on the finger, like is that is that what you're referring to? Because that was in the second Creep Show movie, I think. Golden lovers, happy birthday, Solo Central Time. Much love and God bless. Thank you for everything. My birthday is this Tuesday, and I am excited for NXT. Whoa, Golden lovers, happy birthday. You got a hell of a birthday gift coming up on Tuesday night. You're going to be flipping channels that night? That's how we used to do it in the old days at Raw and Nitro. We had to flip back and forth, and there was no DVR. There was no DVR. There was no TiVo. All right, I'll get to your other messages here in a second. We'll get back to this. Uh, but right now, we are at 457 likes. So please uh, continue to hit that thumbs up. The more likes we get on the video, thank you. Uh, the and more that. And a thank you. And shush. The more and that the algorithm you. will include it in the uh, recommended. So keep hitting that like button. Let's uh, take a break here and do some Be the Booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to Be the Booker. Let's take a pause and do some B2B here. And then we can get back to the, uh, the horror talk and whatever else you want to talk about here. We got to book some matches. I'm bringing some of that birthday luck with me here. Hoping it rubs off on Be The Booker. We start out here with the monster among men. Braun Strowman. Doesn't like your flippy wrestlers. Braun Strowman. Braun Strowman, former Universal Champion, going to go one on one with the Heartbreak Kid, Shawn Michaels. <laughs> Shawn Michaels always had a knack, man. He had a knack. For, well, I mean, he'd have good matches with anybody, but he had some really good matches with bigger opponents, people who were bigger than him. And I think uh, Braun is more than capable in the ring. I think Shawn Michaels and Braun Strowman actually would have been an excellent match. Although in that image you just saw there, that is pilled up Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 14. I think even even pilled up Shawn Michaels with, with a bad back would still be able to go out there and have a very good match. All right, ladies, be the booker. Here we go. We got one half of the Iconics, Billy Kay. I don't know if Billy Kay is still wrestling or not. I don't believe so. Billy Kay and Luna Vachon. And that's not a buzzer for Luna. I just think that uh, Luna Vachon and Billy Kay would not be a very good match. Never, I never really saw much out of Billy Kay in the ring. You know, she had her character stuff down pat. She was doing the comedy character in WWE. You asked me to remember a, a good Billy Kay match, and we'd be sitting here all night. I can't think of one. 
All right, here we go. We got the Rockers, Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty. I was just talking about the Shawn and the Marty, and look at this. We land on the Shawn and the Marty. How do you like that? Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty are going to take on Ric Flair and Rowdy Roddy Piper. Do you realize that that run right there with Piper and Flair when they had the Raw Tag Team titles, which some people may not even remember, that run that they had as champions in 2006, I want to say, I think it was the year before I started my podcast, that run is what saved Roddy Piper's life. Because he was diagnosed, I want to say it was lymphoma, or maybe Hodgkin's lymphoma. Only reason he knew about it is because I, I guess they were testing or whatever and probably doing blood work at the time. He was active in the company, and that's how they discovered it. Probably saved the man's life by holding those tag team titles. But you got Piper and Flair against the Rockers, man. There you go. I mean, how do you vote against that? I'd say that's pretty damn good. And that is Be the Booker. Yes, it was uh, 2006. It was 2006. Uh, base beer is, did I like Jeepers Creepers? Turtleneck Christian for the win. I did like Jeepers Creepers. I think there was a second one. Uh, I'm just thinking of the first one. I, I did. I actually liked that. That had uh, Justin Long in it. Jeremy. Might as well give you my super chat V card also. Happy birthday solo. Man, look at look at me. Look at this. I'm I'm deflowering all of these people tonight. Deflowering more people than Wilt Chamberlain in his prime. And Richie, you also forgot that Michael Myers got manhandled by a geek in his last movie. You know what? I did forget about that. And I think I tried to block it out. But uh, yes, that that is part of the reason why I voted Michael Myers as the one who has been bastardized the most. Oh my God, you had to remind me of that. You had to go there. You had to remind me of that. By the way, if you want to know what I thought of that movie, and the, I think all three of the recent Halloween movies, I have reviews for each one up on the channel. So if you search them out, probably sound off extra or whatever solemn monster Halloween review. It'll come up. You'll get my thoughts on what I thought about that movie. And Emilio does beating Michael Myers in a shoot in Halloween ends, make Corey an icon. Now it makes him infamous. I wouldn't say it makes him an icon. Uh, there were four Jeepers Creepers movies. The last one was the worst. There were four of them. Okay, I didn't know there were four of them. Halloween. <laughs> Evil dies tonight. Yes. Just scream it over and over again like they did in the movie. Evil dies tonight. In case you didn't hear it the first time. You'll hear it the eighth time. Evil dies tonight. Don't worry, they'll get another stab at the Halloween apple in a few years. Even though they said Halloween ends, Halloween ended as far as Jamie Lee Curtis goes. That does not mean that Halloween has truly ended. Give it a few years, we'll get another one. I guarantee you they'll start all over again. They'll be able to make money off that movie long after you and I are not even on this earth anymore. That, that franchise will still be making money. Hydrograd has a uh, super chat coming in. I didn't see for how much, but it says, what are your favorite Halloween sequels? His are, in no particular order, 3, 4, and H2O. And how dirty did they do Jamie at the beginning of Halloween 6? That was BS. I agree, that was BS. My favorite of the sequels, see, that puts a smile on my when I think of the Halloween movies and the Halloween sequels, 
that makes me happy. And the one that I would say I like the most... See, 3 is a hard one to rank. It's a very polarizing one because it, it has nothing to do with Michael Myers. So to call it a sequel is not really... It's not really fair, right? Because you're thinking of, of Myers. I put 3 in a category by itself. But if you want to rank them as far as sequels, 3 is my favorite. The original, and then Halloween 3. If you take that out of the equation because it has nothing to do with Michael Myers, that might be my... my. <laughs> I'm just staring at that. It's just mesmerizing. I was going to say, that may be my least favorite uh, of all these sequels there, is Brie Mode. You want a new horror movie? There you go. Just call it Brie Mode. And every time the killer kills one of his victims, you hear that. That's pretty scary. You see, I was I was paralyzed with fear there for a few seconds. <laughs> Bree against Myers? That's a tough one. I don't know. After the way Myers looked in that last movie, I, might, I think Bree probably would have him beat. Anyway, uh, for me, it's three. If, if I had to rank it, three. Four. The one with Danielle Harris as the little girl. Um, and then two. Now, you know what? I, I take that back. I'm sorry. Three, two, and then four. I think I, I, I sometimes I'm a little hard on two. Two is not as good as the original, but it's an extension of the original, and I, I did enjoy it. So three, two, and four in that order would be how I would rank the sequels after the first one. Uh, Samoan Fen, you should do a full review of Halloween Resurrection. Well, they're actually airing it at 8 p.m. on Tuesday, so it's going to be in direct competition with NXT and AEW. You saying that I should forego all the wrestling shows and just review Halloween Resurrection? I don't think I don't think the uh, the traffic would be that good for that. Yeah, part three is something that I think you will find a lot of people who, when it first came out or when they first started watching the movies. Especially if they just heard, oh, there's a third one, I'm going to watch it. And then they realize there's no Michael Myers and they get angry, right? So I think the film gets a lot of criticism and hate because of that reason. Because people feel like, oh, it's like a bait and switch and therefore they blame the movie. If you just judge the movie on its own merits, it's actually a really good, creepy horror movie. And it's almost got like a synth score to it. Um... I just I just love it. I really do. Tom Atkins, I think, is is great in the movie. Um, there's a scene in that movie where I don't want to give too much away, but there's a scene in that movie where a woman uh, gets a good chunk of her face lasered off accidentally, and then bugs crawl out. I mean, it it it's really creepy stuff. And again, not. CGI, it's just practical effects, which I think are more jarring. Uh, you see that in a lot of the 80s horror movies. Uh, to me, it's just creepier and scarier than most CGI. So there's just a lot of elements of the movie that I really, really enjoy. And I, I also used to hate the fact that Michael wasn't part of it. I said, it's just bullshit. What the hell? Right? This is not a Halloween movie. But that was the concept that they were going for. You know, Deborah Hill and John Carpenter originally were going for this concept that every year they would release a new Halloween movie and it would be almost like one big anthology series and every story would be independent of the other. And people didn't want that. They just, they loved the Michael Myers character. They demanded that he be brought back and that's why you had part four and five and six and so on and so forth. Um, I think that they had a, it was a nice idea conceptually, but the way they executed it pissed a lot of people off. If you are one of those people and you go back and give that movie a second chance, I think you'll enjoy it. I know because I was one of those people. I used, I used to hate it too. And 
Now I love it. But again, we can be here all night talking about horror movie stuff, so. We, uh, we should probably wrap up. Oh, we got, uh, oh, look at this. It's our good buddy, good mic work. It's Greg. I believe it's Greg. Just went up off my screen. We'll find out in a second. If it is Greg, even if it's not Greg, shout out to Greg. Go check out good mic work on his channel. He's a very honest man. He didn't name his channel Great Mike Work. He called himself Good Mike Work. You know, he recognizes, ah, I'm pretty good, you know. <laughs> I may not be the best on the mic, but I'm pretty good. I appreciate his honesty. Uh, Richie, Richie, Michael Myers was basically Roman Reigns in the last Halloween movie. Face Beerus, remember Masters of Horror. Uh, the Masters of Horror series. I don't. I don't. Uh, Good Mike Work says, Happy birthday, brother, at work and saw that you were live, so I thought I would poke my bald head in real quick. Hope your day was delightful. That's right. I keep forgetting that you are out on the West Coast. So it is a lot earlier where you are. Uh, but thank you for that. I believe uh, Greg referred to me earlier on on the Mount Rushmore of podcasters or content creators as the George Washington. And as I told him, I, I like to think I have better hair than George, George Washington. I, I hope I at least have that going for me. But that's high praise. So thank you very much. Good mic work. Go check him out on YouTube. Good mic work commentaries. Oh, we got Richie. We got Bass Beerus. We've got Bass Beerus again, Blue Kane against Blue Myers. And Hydrograd, the kid in front of the TV with the pumpkin head in Halloween 3. All I will say. Yeah. Dude, there's some disturbing scenes in that movie. There really, there really are. That's what I mean. If people actually watch it from start to finish, I think. I think they would realize, you know what, on its own merits, it's actually pretty good. And it's funny, too, because some of the actors will appear at a lot of these uh, Comic-Con-type expos and conventions. And now it's like the movie has a cult following that it just didn't have all those years ago. So I'm not the only one that feels that way. They've done panels, and you know, people go crazy, and they want to get their autographs and photos. And So the people who were in that movie, which was made, I mean, when did Halloween 3 come out? Probably 82. Look, everyone, it's Samoa Bro. And all these years later, you know? There it is. It's a little backed up, but there's good mic work. Thank you for the Samoa Bro. Base Beerus says, real hair, cry me a river. You'll notice Jack Perry is still, he has not been brought back to television. I said the other night, I asked, when are they back in Chicago? And somebody said sometime around Thanksgiving, I think Dynamite is in Chicago. That's when you bring back Jack Perry. The next time AEW is in Chicago is the night that you bring him back to TV. That's what I would do. You want to get maximum heat? There you go. House of a Thousand Corpses, yeah. Yeah, the, the Rob Zombie stuff. I wouldn't say I'm really a big fan of the Rob Zombie stuff, even the Rob Zombie Halloween movies. The Myers mask in the first Rob Zombie Halloween movie actually looked very good. Uh, I wasn't really a fan of the, I think the second one where like you could see his eye and everything. Like, I don't think you should be able to see that much of, of the shape. But I will say the mask in that first uh, zombie one was on point. Yeah, I got asked before what I thought the worst mask in the franchise was, and to me it was easily part five. But if I had to rank the best ones, yeah, honestly, the original, obviously the original would be number one. I think that first zombie movie, the first, uh, the Rob Zombie mask from the first uh, Halloween movie he did, it'd be pretty high up there on the list.
What if he gets cheered in Chicago? It would be by maybe pockets of fans. He'll he'll get heat. He'll get tons of heat in Chicago. Power Spy and says, I've only seen two of Rob Zombie's films being the Halloween remakes. Yeah, it was like uh, House of a Thousand Corpses, uh, The Devil's Rejects was another one, I believe. Yeah, it's. I'm not really a fan. Samoan fan, why, why, uh, why, why pick one? I mean, you know. I'm not a picky guy. They were all good. Turtlehead. Our old friend Turtlehead. Thanks for giving me a place to hang out and threaten these pencil neck geeks. If we don't get enough Be the Booker likes. Happy birthday. Turtlehead, thank you. Wouldn't be a stream without Turtlehead joining us. Uh, yeah, Deputy Dog wants to know if they have, I wonder if they've auctioned off any of the old Halloween stuff like the masks. I don't know where the masks would be. Like the original Shatner mask. I mean, some of that stuff would be worth a fortune. I'm sure it's in the hands of some collectors. I don't know where all the masks are, though. Austin says, fun fact, good mic work is one of the reasons I found your channel. Also, I'm going to fast lane tonight. We'll have fun. You'll have fun. If you're there live for these shows, you, you always have a good time. Base Beerus dropping 15 bucks. Did you have lo mein tonight or Kung Pao chicken? I don't have Kung Pao. Kung Pao has too much of a kick. I did have lo mein. I had lo mein and fried rice. Thank you for asking. That's my birthday meal. Some wonton soup, some fried rice, and some... And I usually have brown rice. It's my birthday, so I splurge. And I go back to the old days when I was probably 15 pounds heavier than I am. And I was having lo mein and fried rice every week. And now I just do it on my birthday. My whole... I didn't realize that Base Beerus had triggered Naya's hole, but there it is. There's a horror movie for you. Listening to that sound. Sounds like a dying animal. I say it every week. I want the masks from Jason X. Yeah, that was a pretty cool mask. I used to have it. I used to have, uh, I got it from some Halloween store years ago. It had like a metallic finish to it. I mean, it was some cheap plastic, but it had like a, you could almost like see a reflection in the mask. Uh, like it was a silver Jason mask. And uh, I don't know where the hell it is. I don't have it anymore. Yeah, I don't have it anymore. Maybe I'll buy a hockey mask and I'll wear it while I do commentary next Friday. Might sound a little muffled, though, if I have the mask over my face. But I'll probably look better. Uh, buffalo wings, yes or no? No. Nah. I'll do them, but... The wings, but... Not really a buffalo wings guy. Uh, Super Pony, no, I have not seen it yet. Probably will not. I'm, I'm behind on those movies. <laughs> My hole against Brie mode is the new version of Freddy vs. Jason. Freddy vs. Jason is one of the few movies I can remember I saw in the theater where it got a standing ovation when the credits rolled. That and Inglorious Bastards when they kill all the Nazis. Samoan fan, buy or sell, Brie mode or Nia's hole. Look at that. What, what is the obsession with? What is the obsession with this? 
They're equally nightmarish. And finally, Base Beerus he is in whole mode. Thank you very much. All right, this has been fun. I have uh, very much enjoyed myself tonight. We had a good SmackDown. Final hype for Fastlane tomorrow night. I will be live as soon as the pay-per-view is over. We will go after or go over uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly from the show. And then, of course, uh, Sunday is episode 829 of the sound off we'll be covering a lot of stuff on that show as well and then back live again on monday and then we got a big day on tuesday so every single day between now and tuesday there will be new content live and otherwise coming from yours truly and i hope that you will listen i hope that you will watch i hope that you will come back here on the channel and you will join me and you will like this video and you will subscribe and you will tell other people to subscribe and if they say that they will not subscribe you will choke them until they turn blue and you will drag them over to the computer. You will take their finger and you will have push the button down on the keyboard or click the mouse so that they like the video. And then you will revive them and then you will leave and you will go home and you will speak nothing about what just happened. That is what I want you to do. There you go. Anyway, uh, thank you guys for all the birthday love. You guys are awesome. Until next year. Be well, stay safe, and uh, we will do it all over again for Fast Lane. In the Fast Lane we go tomorrow night. Thank you again for the birthday love. We'll see you tomorrow.